Hi, everyone. Uh, I, too, want to start by congratulating our distinguished new members. Uh, every year that I come to this meeting, I always feel like my name tag should say Jill Abramson Pretender. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, it's especially gratifying to me to be introduced by our Madam President, who was my colleague for so many years at the New York Times. Frankly, when I first came to the Times in 1997, I was a bit intimidated by Linda Greenhouse. She, she just won the Pulitzer Prize for her brilliant coverage of the Supreme Court, but also, she had reviewed my first book in the Times Book Review, and she had criticized my writing style as <laughs> relentlessly anecdotal. So, <laughs> so when I was writing th this, my new book, Merchants of Truth, I had those words ringing in my ears like every morning when I sat down to write. Uh, and, you know, the, the first two talks uh, were, were so fascinating. And, you know, they struck a chord with me because Lincoln and Audubon were both so canny about how to promote their images in the press. And my book deals, you know, with another president who is a uh, a master manipulator of the news media. But I have a feeling that uh, Donald Trump's idea of useful knowledge, if he, could, <laughs> if he could come up with one, would be how to compose an outrageous tweet. Uh, but, and, and perhaps, too, I'm relieved that our wonderful portrait of uh, Mr. Franklin, who's usually looking down towards us, is covered up because I think he would faint dead away listening to me, to me describe the current state of the news media since he was widely considered the greatest you know, journalist of his era as the publisher and brains behind the Pennsylvania Gazette. Uh, I wanted to write uh, this book, Merchants of Truth, because as managing editor and executive editor of the Times, I had, had lived through this tumultuous period, very challenging, daunting, sometimes thrilling uh, period, which was the transition at the Times and at every other major newspaper from print to, to the digital world. And the timeline that I chose, for, and I wanted to write a narrative history, and my timeline was about 2007 to two, 2017, where literally everything changed. And I'm, I'm going to be talking about some news organizations which became very competitive with the Times during my tenure, but I suspect none of you have ever looked at them or perhaps even heard of them. But you'll meet them in a few minutes. Yeah, the, the period that I'm dealing with in Merchants of Truth is not the, the news media's or journalism's finest hour. Uh, you know, I, what I wanted to do is replicate, at least in structure, a book that played a role in inspiring me to pursue a career in journalism by David Halberstam, who is a fantastic Times reporter and wrote The Best and the Brightest, and later a book about the news media of his time in 1979 called The Powers That Be. And it, too, is a narrative history, and he focused on four news organizations that he thought represented the news media at the zenith of their power and profits, Times, CBS, The Washington Post, and The LA Times. I, too, chose uh, four news organizations to 
for my narrative, and they were the New York Times and the Washington Post. At the point I started my research, they were both still struggling, uh, especially financially, but in this disruptive transition to becoming digital first. And then two of the digital newcomers who had never uh, published in print at all, Vice and BuzzFeed, who had only recently, in 2012, jumped into doing news. Uh, but by the time I began my work, BuzzFeed, for example, had an investigative reporting unit as big as the one at the New York Times. So to me, having the opportunity to go deep inside these new, shiny digital news organizations was an exciting proposition. Uh, you know, Halberstam was, was also catching the story at a moment when the media was widely trusted by the public. Not so today. And, you know, not completely because of, but contributors to declining public trust, which is now at, you know, an absolute low point, was, you know, faulty coverage first and foremost before the Iraq war, so many page one stories uh, built on very faulty intelligence about Iraq and WMD. Uh, you know, some, some readers were very disillusioned and angry over coverage of Hillary Clinton's email, sir, private email server, which seemed to be blown up into something approaching Watergate. Uh, and even now, there's a healthy debate simmering over whether the press had too much coverage of Trump and Russia collusion. I personally don't think so, but uh, that, that battle rages on, and we'll see how it turns out. Uh, when I talk about you know, the rocky financial times, uh, the, 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 the search and, and race to, to bring in any kind of new revenue really changed the standards of the best uh, newspapers. And this is a story from Politico about a salon, a group of salon dinners that Catherine Weymouth, who is the granddaughter of Catherine Graham and became publisher of The Post, she sometimes wore her grandmother's pearls to The Post. Uh, but, you know, she decided that she would charge lobbyists uh, $25,000 to sponsor dinners at her house where she would offer them direct off-the-record access to post reporters. And this really flouted, you know, the ethical uh, set, you know, the ethical standards that required, you know, some clear separation between news and business. And none of the reporters at the Post wanted to participate, and I suspect slipped an invitation to, to Politico. Uh, You know, the, the troubles at the Post were so severe that in a very short period of time, its newsroom went from 1,000 journalists to barely 600. And the quality of the newspaper that had proudly published Woodward and Bernstein had clearly diminished. Uh, at the same time, the New York Times made a very bold decision that all of the press analysts predicted would be unsuccessful. They decided to install a paywall for their heaviest digital readers. And that was successful almost from the first year. They had half a million people signed up for digital New York Times subscriptions. Uh, the original sin of the digital age was the conventional wisdom and mantra that news wants to be free on the internet, the belief that people would simply not pay for it. Uh, and so 
for digital news, there was only one source of revenue. The newspaper had to have circulation and advertising. On the web, it was only advertising. And a print dollar was a digital dime. Digital advertising really did not bring in all that money. Uh, and the time period that I cover in my book also is the changeover from people having loyalty to one particular publication and instead getting most of their news from their Facebook feeds. 62% uh, of American adults see most of their news on Facebook, which shows you how powerful it is. It's effectively the biggest publisher ever known. Uh, at the same time, of course, uh, we elected you know, a new president in 2016, and certainly the media's kind of failure to see the rising tide of anger among non-college educated white voters that preceded the 2016 vote was another, you know, black mark. But, you know, Trump was elected and ran, you know, against the news media. Katie Turr of NBC had to, uh, get a bodyguard to even cover Trump rallies. The crowds got so stirred up uh, against, against journalists. And of course, President Trump has nonstop railed against journalists as fake news and enemies of the people. Uh, of course, he is a creature of the media himself. Uh, and, you know, his, his almost daily tweet diatribes against journalism. That's one example, a typical one. Uh, you know, he loves to call the Times the failing New York Times, which it is not at this point. But I put this lurid uh, New York Post cover uh, out there from the early part of his career as a real estate mogul when he was about to marry his second wife. And he had been mentored by the despicable Roy Cohn and how to use the media. And, you know, Cohn's idea was pretty simplistic. All publicity is good publicity. And also that you, even if you've had a terrible defeat, you've got to declare immediate victory, which is why when the bar letter came out, President Trump declared like complete, uh, you know, vindication. And now that more of the actual report is being read, he's back to calling it a terrible hit job. Uh, but, the polarization of the audience has been one of the really disturbing trends of this period. Sorry, that's just another picture of Trump in action pre-presidency. He decided to do The Apprentice, which had huge ratings, in half an hour consulting nobody. So that gave us an early look at what his governing style might be. But the polarization of the audience, both on television and in print, has been another very unhealthy development of this period. <clears throat> and you get Jay Rosen as an academic at NYU who writes a very popular press blog, what he has to say, that you know it, it, it's an open invitation to authoritarianism. <clears throat> Um, you know, the, the, the issue for, that concerns me most is that there has to be reputable news organizations digging into the issues that really affect our lives because, as all of you know, the founders of this country were deathly afraid of over-centralized power and 
saw the press as a bulwark against it, that we would hold power accountable and bring the people the information they needed to carry on with their lives. Uh, that's become difficult to have a common source of information and news that everybody looks to uh, for both of those things. And my book starts in 2007, which is the year that everything changed. The iPhone was introduced by Steve Jobs that year and has become the dominant way people read the news. Uh, Facebook's news feed started. Uh, and you know that became the big you know it basically the the mighty algorithm of facebook basically replaced the role of us editors in deciding what news people should see and fed them a steady diet of news that they were certain to like and agree with. So readers were almost never, if they're getting their news from Facebook, exposed to anything that challenged their pre-existing views. So what's Vice? Um, Vice started out as a very lewd laddie magazine. Uh, you, you can see there, you know, uh, an uh, open mouth with um, a tab of acid on the tongue. And hard to believe it, but the founders of that magazine, these two scruffy gentlemen, became billionaires in the media business. Vice is the biggest and uh, most highly you know, valued in terms of valuation uh, digital uh, media companies. They, and this is Jonah Peretti of BuzzFeed, uh, you know, which also began with fun and games. Uh, you know, what, what Jonah Peretti discovered was how information goes viral and uh, it turns out that photos of adorable puppies and kittens are totally shareable. People can't resist sending them on. So he built BuzzFeed on sharing on Facebook uh, and built it again into a major news organization. It published the Steele dossier and you know, com is, is very competitive in the news space. Uh, Vice and BuzzFeed also became so successful because they invented a completely new kind of advertising called native advertising or branded advertising. And, uh, sorry, sorry. Um, here, here's a, a, a typical, this is actually a, an ad on BuzzFeed, HBO paid for the ad. You can see in tiny letters up there, paid post. But this is like indistinguishable for the kind of silly articles that appear on BuzzFeed. So there's virtually no difference between the content of the ad and the regular content of the publication. And when I was at the Times, I remember our ad director said to me, we will never do that. It's unethical to confuse readers. And now inside the New York Times building, there's a several hundred person ad agency of creative writers who do native ads. And I'm just going to show you like a second, a few seconds of one. Whoop. Just so you can see, it looks like a Times news video. It's like kind of uncommon for females to know how to tattoo in prison. I could say I was one of the good ones. We get a, actually a CD player, we take it apart and there's a little mortar inside of it. These are all get women a inmates. Guitar string, sharpen it real fine get a, the ballpoint pen, regular big pen, cut it, put the needle through, attach it to a mortar, plug it in, and there's your gun right there. This is done with a single needle in prison. I relied on my time down on a small quarter mile gravel track to help me maintain my sanity. And I 
made thousands and thousands and thousands of left turns on that. Anyway, that too is an ad for HBO for the show that was so popular, Orange is the New Black. But the style of it, and you know, most people really don't know, there's the typical Times T what T brand studio is. But so again, what 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 concerns me is a possibility of confusing ad content with with news content. Uh, this is um, a graph that, that shows you how trust in, in the, the news media has gone down radically even since 2001, let alone from Halberstam's time. Uh, this shows uh, the, the drop in revenue that, that really became unbearable, causing worry of bankruptcy at the times, even uh, after the 2008 financial crisis. Um, irony of ironies, th th this is a, a story of BuzzFeeds that actually was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in international reporting. This is, is um, a Vice story that won four e Emmys about the uh, white nationalists who protested the Confederate statues in Charlottesville. Um, this is a Times Innovation Report, and you know, I'll, I'll close with, with that. Uh, I had prided myself when I was managing editor of trying to lead the New York Times through the transition from print to digital first. I knew the print decline would have to be more like this than like this because it still was responsible for all of my career, for most of the revenue, and certainly the profits of the times. But this report came out in 2014 and concluded that we were total digital laggards. And, uh, by 2014, like all of these business model problems, the you know, need to do native advertising had caused a lot of friction between me and the corporate side of the times. And as I bet most of you know, I was sacked as executive editor. Uh, and very also disrupting for, for me, but uh, I just want, wanted to, sorry, end with uh, a quote from, and this, this is a good book, depressing about the state of our country right now, that nationalism, tribalism, dislocation, fears of social change, and the hatred of outsiders are on the rise again as people locked in their partisan silos and filter bubbles are losing a sense of shared reality and the ability to communicate across social and sectarian lines. Uh, very, very scary. Uh, I wish that I had in my book uh, big solutions to all of these problems. Uh, one thing I do think, and I'll be anxious to hear your questions, is that the truth has to get louder. Uh, journalists and the best news organizations have to really publicly uh, remind citizens of the important work that they do and the seminal role they play in a democracy. I was glad to see Jeff Bezos spend $5 million for an ad uh, saying just that in the fourth quarter of the Super Bowl. Uh, big audience. Uh, and, you know, some nonprofits, ProPublica, the group Linda cited as a group I'm involved in, you know, has successfully uh, done excellent prize-winning investigative journalism and given it to newspapers that can't afford to do it anymore. Uh, the news desert created by over 500 local newspapers closing in the past five years has spawned some new nonprofit 
local digital news organizations, the Texas Tribune, the Min Post that are excellent, but they can't begin to fill the vacuum. So uh, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, things are looking much brighter at the Times and the Post, thanks seriously in large part to President Trump and the Trump bump. And now, you know, the digital newcomers, Vice and BuzzFeed, are struggling. Uh, their business model to piggyback on Facebook and YouTube has completely fallen apart because Facebook and Google gobble up now 90% of new digital advertising. So when I began, the organizations in trouble where the legacy newspapers envious of the newcomers and the story completely reversed on me, which was a challenge but also made the project so interesting. And lastly, uh, writing about my own profession, I went into this knowing how thin-skinned journalists are. You know, we can dish it out, but we can't take it. And Vice Media was especially upset with my portrayal, even though I had given them my manuscript early to scrub. And about two weeks before my book was published, someone warned me that they were going to mount an elaborate opposition campaign against me. Uh, so I knew something was coming. I didn't know what it would be. And it was a lesson, actually, in what I was writing about, how you know, information and misinformation can go viral, because one of their correspondents put six passages on Twitter that they said, I had plagiarized. They were completely anodyne. My book has 70 pages of source citations, uh, 834 uh, individual credits, and I did mess up six of them, which I own and I'm sorry for and have apologized repeatedly. But that story went viral, the idea that Jill Abramson, former executive editor of the Times, is a plagiarist, you know, was too delicious to resist. And the story spread and spread. And, you know, I responded, but, uh, you know, it took uh, Jeff Bezos and his affair with someone in those pictures to wipe me out of the news. <laughs> so... A toast to Mr. Bezos, and now I'd lo love to take a few questions. Where's Linda? Right. Yeah. Um, hi. hi, Ron Fairman from Philadelphia. Um, I noticed toward the end of your talk you had a graph that showed um, a spread between older adults and younger adults in terms of their willingness to believe what's published in the press. When I talk to my patients, some of whom are now older than I am, um, or even when I talk to my mother-in-law, who's really older than I am, it seems to me that that gap may be narrowing and that more and more older people are losing their trust in the press. Can you comment on that? Is that true, you think? I'm not sure. I haven't seen any recent studies by age. Uh, but, you know, the, as the polarization continues, I mean, the night that uh, the Mueller report came out, I was forcing myself to flip between Sean Hannity and Rachel Maddow. And, you know, it, it's like two different universes, two different realities. And when you're confronted with that day after day, it's hard to, uh, to, you know, to trust and think either side is, is telling the truth. And the, the audiences for cable news are old. Uh, the average uh, audience for Fox is 70 years old. Uh, so, so but, that, that's, you know, that's, but not, that's not old here. Yeah, right, okay, sorry. Um, 
<laughs> well, well said. Uh, <laughs> but I, the answer is that honestly, I don't know. Uh, it seems pervasive at all ages. Uh, and that the only information and news people tend to trust is what they're seeing in their Facebook feeds because those news stories are sent to them by family and friends, not by editors of the New York Times. Hi, it's Eric Horvitz uh, from Microsoft Research. Um, my investigations and conversations uh, have revealed that algorithmic methods are much deeper and, and finer grained than we think. You mentioned algorithms once in your talk when it came to newsfeed, uh, but there apparently are experimentation platforms that do A-B compare to figure out which content is getting the clicks before right. people even see this stuff. Everyone does that now. And so what's your reflection on, on the long-term uh, outcome of that kind of thing, optimization algorithms that are, that are sort of uh, well, taking our attention? It's an, I, I hate to be such a downer this afternoon, but you know, my bud, judgment is another regrettable trend. And what it means is that you know, both the Washington Post and the New York Times are invariably picking stories that are getting the most clicks, so-called clickbait. And you know, it's not only Facebook, but there's an organization called Chartbeat, which measures what news story people are reading every second. And one of the reasons that there are so many different Trump stories in both the Times and the Washington Post is that those stories were being clicked on. And a friend of mine who writes a weekly column at the Times, not our Madam President, uh, told me that like subconsciously he just knows when he wasn't writing about Trump, he wasn't getting the readership that put him in the top stories category. So the algorithm has had a pernicious effect and it definitely influences what stories are played where. And at the Post, reporters themselves do A-B testing of different headlines. Well, at, at the I'll just say, at, I was shocked to visit the Washington Post newsroom a couple of years ago, and there were screens all over the newsroom that show how many people are reading every story at every that second. moment and where they're located and where the you know where the the viewers are, are coming from. It was like some kind of it was, it was scary. For, okay. Uh, yes, uh, Matt Bakavoy from the University of Nebraska Press. <clears throat> um, last week when I was reading the whole Mueller report, there are a lot of footnote citations to some of our most esteemed journalists and investigative reporters. Um, what's, your, what, what's your feeling about the deliberateness of that? Well, you know, it, it, Linda and I, from being in Washington for so many years, know that it's not unusual for investigators to follow the investigative reporting of the best news organizations. Uh, the difference is that Mr. Mueller, of course, had subpoena power, and a frustration of journalists sometimes is that we don't. Uh, <laughs> but. <laughs> But I don't think there's anything untoward about footnotes to, you know, journalists' work. And I was sort of surprised by how much of that report I knew already because I've been soaking up uh, all these stories. Uh, Mm-hmm. Possibly, sure. Okay. Sarah Miller McCune, Sage Publishing. It's been a long time since I saw you first in Los Angeles, but I have two short questions. One is, why do you think Jeff Bezos uh, bought the Washington Post? And second, why did you pick um, Vice and BuzzFeed? 
Uh, I think that Jeff Bezos had good intentions and pure intentions when he bought the Washington Post, that he bought it per, out of personal money. It went for $250 million, which was pocket change for him. Uh, and that he was genuinely trying to rescue, you know, an important institution in American society that was falling apart. And at first he said no to Don Graham when he, he was first called, he said, I don't know anything about the newspaper business. But then he thought more deeply about it, and especially in terms of technology, you know, making their website uh, fast and fabulous, he thought he could be of help, and, and so he bought it. And now I think he's finished building the biggest house in Washington, D.C. So who knows uh, once he gets bitten by the Beltway culture, like how it'll turn out. Uh, Vice and BuzzFeed I pick Vice because they were the, 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 the outfit that first uh, figured out that video was going to be so profitable. Video news and why you see it, and I know it annoyingly pops up sometimes when you're reading the body of articles, and that's because the advertising premiums for video ads are huge. And so the, a cliche in, in, in news right now is the pivot to video. Everyone's trying to do more video, and Vice had started doing it in 2008 and had pretty much gone all video. And BuzzFeed, because I was fascinated by the science of virality, <clears throat> and Jonah Peretti, the, the owner of BuzzFeed, was like the, the guru of it, and it just interested me that you know, the New York Times couldn't afford to have a party at the Republican convention in 2012, but BuzzFeed did. <laughs> uh, a question back there. Philip Kitcher from Columbia. Um, I was struck by what you said as a possible solution, speaking truth more loudly. And one of the things that you might want from uh, in news media is for the public to be given sometimes alarming information and sometimes technical information. I'm thinking in particular about climate change. And it did seem that in the early part of this century, the New York Times was unduly cautious, perhaps even cowardly, in, in doing it on the one hand and on the other hand. And yeah. more recently, it's gotten much braver. But how does one, how, given all, everything you've said, um, do you get a news medium to bring these technical things before a public and to explain them and to warn. I think you're right about climate change, that uh, the coverage in the Times and elsewhere, you know, has rejected, you know, the arguments and statements of the climate change deniers. Uh, you know, the conventions of journalism until pretty recently was to make sure, you know, to have objective coverage, which to some journalists never to me meant you published on the one hand on the other stories. I've always believed you have to do enough thorough reporting that the weight of the evidence you collect tips in a certain direction. You can get comment from the other side, but not, you know, have equipoise. Uh, so, you know, I'm hopeful about the content of, of the coverage. The, the, the Times and the Post have, have covered, you know, the ethics problems at both the, the EPA and the Interior Department lately, I think, really, really well. And, you know, the magazine devoted the entire well of uh, the, the magazine to a single story written by Nathaniel Rich about, you know, the, the, the shrinking shorelines in this country. Uh, but the, the, the part of your question that's just harder to figure out is publishing now goes beyond just pressing the publish, pub, publishing button and have the story appear. It involves in making sure it spreads and effectively 
go, you hope it goes viral because that is information we all agree the citizenry needs. But uh, it tends to be, you know, the more sort of scandal-oriented things that create argument that circulate most prominently on social media. So I think there has to be another way. Uh, and I think that, you know, just journalists, when they go out and, and, and talk in public, have to do it. And the, the journalists who have these fat contracts to go on cable every night, uh, mostly on, on CNN and MSNBC, but there are a dozen reporters in the Washington Bureau of the Times that have six-figure con contracts to be on TV. And I think even if they aren't asked about it, reminding uh, the audience of the importance of the work they do is one way they can differentiate themselves from the partisans and former prosecutors that they sit next to. Uh, and maybe, maybe I'll just say, um, in terms of the ability of the web to go deep, uh, you know, it's, it's really, I mean, the main thing in, in print always was the space constraint. You know, a typical right. story in the New York Times is 800 to 1,000 words, but there's no word limit on the web. So, uh, right, you know, and I don't think the you know, conventional wisdom that everything has to be short because of declining attention spans. No, so, I mean, uh, I was just going to say, It's you know, true. At the time, some of those, like, things that jump into four pages in the newspaper zoom to most read and have high completion rates. Or, uh, you know, when I was covering the Times before the web, uh, the general public didn't have access to Supreme Court opinions, the actual opinion, and part of my job was to do the excerpts and key the excerpts into the, into the system. And now, of course, you just have a link, and, and the readers can click on it and get the entire opinion and read as much of it as they want, and, and the whole world opens up to them. And, you know, for, for science and technology, of course, needs explanation, but for readers who want to go levels and levels deep, the web smartly used uh, can, you know, is, is a tool uh, for that. Okay. Uh, okay, great. Bill Shop, uh, UCLA. Uh, you've said that, this is fascinating, of course, to all in this room, and you said that uh, we should find, we need to find another way. I'm not a historian. But I don't think that this is necessarily entirely unique in the history of the United States. I think back to the Vietnam War time. I think back to the Civil War time. I think back to Jefferson and John Adams. And I believe that the American populace was similarly greatly divided. And so I asked the question, what can we learn from the past so that we can leave this room today with a feeling of optimism <laughs> for the future? There you go. Well, I, I am an eternal optimist be, because I think good storytelling and accurate news is a human want. It's, it's necessary, so it's going to survive. And you're right. I mean, another period in history, I mean, right after a magnificent period in the press, which was the muckrakers, who during Teddy Roosevelt's time helped bring about the first uh, food safety laws and anti-child labor laws and antitrust law, uh, you know, was followed by this vicious period of the penny press and all kinds of scurrilous stories that weren't true and were used to ruin prominent people. And things do go in, go in cycles. And, you know, I, I do believe that, you know, we won't always be in a period of such polarization as we have now. Uh, 
But it, it's going to take a long time for there to be a new normal, I think. Right. Unfortunately, we have to stop and move on. Jill, thank you. Thanks. Okay.